Um, my pleasure to introduce Wilbur, <coughs> Professor Wilbert Lick. Uh, Dr. Lick joined UCSB's College of Engineering in 1979. He obtained his uh, MAE and his PhD from Rensselaer Polytechnic University in New York, where he's also a star football and lacrosse player. All right. <laughs> including captain of the football team. Wow. Prior to coming to UCSB, he taught at Carver University and Case Western Reserve University. His main expertise is in the environmental sciences, fluid mechanics, numerical methods, and mathematical modeling. His present interests are in understanding and predicting the transport and fate of contaminants from surface and groundwaters and the effect of these <coughs> processes on water quality and organisms. Professor Lick has authored more than 100 papers and as well as a recent textbook uh, titled Sediment and Contaminant Transport in Surface Waters and has served as a consultant for many government and government agencies and uh, private industry as well as private industry. Uh, his talk is titled The Aggregation and Disaggregation of Fine Grain Particles and he's, he'll be talking about his work on, on clays and how that might translate to the smaller size uh, nanoparticles. <coughs> Thank you for the invitation to visit. Uh, the main thing I want to talk about is the aggregation and disaggregation of fine grain sediments. And these are in the micron uh, size range. The justification for this work uh, was our interest in the transport of sediments and contaminants associated with these sediments in surface waters, <coughs> rivers, lakes, and estuaries. Um, now, the main, the most interesting thing about these fine grain particles, even though they're in the micron size range, they don't exist as individual particles. They exist as flocks or aggregates of particles some of which can be quite large, uh, micro, I mean, centimeters in size, uh, and even larger. Uh, and they can consist of 10 to the 6, sometimes as many as 10 to the 8 particles in the flock. And of course, this modifies the settling speed of the flocks and then the transport of these flocks. It also modifies the uh, absorption of contaminants to these flocks because absorption to an individual particle is much different than the absorption of a contaminant to a huge flock with 10 to the 8 particles uh, in them. And of course the transport is also different. So that was our justification for this work. The the thing I really want to talk about today is mostly our experimental work on the aggregation and disaggregation of these particles. Uh, and some theoretical analysis uh, which we use to analyze the experiments. We've also done some work on the transport uh, or the modeling of the transport of these particles in rivers and estuaries. Uh, but <coughs> I'll save that for another day. Uh, most of this work has been summarized in the text that Bob uh, mentioned there, sediment and contaminant transport in surface water. So you can look for the details there, or if you really want the dirty details, you can look at the references uh, which are in that text. This work was done by at least two postdocs and maybe a half a, half a dozen graduate students over the years. Okay. Now, as I said, these particles do not exist as individual, I mean these flocks do not exist as individual particles. Uh, so I take this and just want to show you some pictures uh, of these flocks. On the upper left here, 
are the disaggregated particles. In other words, we took some sediments, put them in a kitchen blender, uh, put up to high speed and broke them apart into their individual particles. And that's a photograph of what we see. The particles, 90% are between 1 and 10 microns in size, and the average particle size is about 4 microns. Now, if you do an experiment or you can just leave these in the uh, in water, they'll, they'll aggregate. The aggregation or the rate of aggregation in the final steady state will depend on at least fluid shear, sediment concentration, salinity of the waters. And those are three parameters that we investigated in our experiments. On the right hand side, uh, top right hand side here, you'll see a flock uh, which is about 100 microns in diameter. And it really consists of a couple clumps uh, made up of individual particles, particles and these clumps form together to form a larger aggregate. The sediment concentration there was about 100 milligrams per liter and a fluid shear of about 100 centimeters per second per centimeter, or 100 inverse seconds. These are conditions that are more or less typical of conditions in the near shore or possibly at the sediment water interface. Now, this, these flocks were produced at a lot, uh, no, a smaller concept sediment concentration, a sediment concentration of 10 milligrams per liter and a fluid shear of 100. And they're quite a bit larger. These flocks are about 400 microns in diameter. Now this one is an interesting one because it's sort of a transient. Uh, if you look at it, it looks more or less looks like a balloon with the particles on the outside and the whole thing floats around uh, for a while, and then it just breaks up. It's a transient uh, flock. But that's about 600 microns in diameter. But you can see the effective density of that flock is incredibly low. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost one, because it's almost pure water. Mm -hmm. Now, these flocks were produced when fluid shear was the dominant mechanism. If there is no fluid shear, then you still get flocculation because of differential settling of the particles. Heavier particles move faster than small particles. They collide and they form flocks. And eventually you'll get a flock that looks like this. It's moving that way. It sort of looks like a teardrop. And over a period of time, it will more and more particles will come in the back and you'll get some collective te uh, teardrop. This is two millimeters in diameter. And it's got to be something on the order of 10 to the 6 particles in that flock. This is one of the largest ones uh, we saw. Uh, that one is about two centimeters uh, in diameter. I don't I think it's fully formed. If we went on and on with the experiment, I would imagine it would begin to look more and more like this one. But this one took about 30 days uh, to develop. So these flocks, these the earlier flocks would take an hour or two to develop. These flocks would take hours, tens of hours, or tens of days in some cases. So. The time to steady state or the time to form a large flock depends very much on the conditions uh, that uh, we have in the experiment. Okay, before I show you the experiments, I do want to talk about collision theory, how particles really collide, because this Yes. Just, just one question. The type of particles before are clays or mixtures? Oh, or yeah. The mixture? particles that I'm, I'll, all the experiments that I'll talk about today are one type of sediment. Mm -hmm. And they're from uh, the inlet to Lake Erie. 
They're fine grain sediments, real sediments. So they're a mixture of different kinds of clays, but predominantly sand or silicon dioxide. Yes. There is a small amount of organic material in there. Um, when we get when we get to that large flock, that's probably more. There could be a lot of organic material holding together these things, but in general, this was small amount of organic matter. Now. <coughs> We did these experiments because we were interested in real sediments. But at the same time, we also did experiments with different types of pure clays, absolutely pure, no organic matter or anything, and pure sands, no clays or organic matter, uh, glass beads, polystyrene beads, uh, some drilling muds which have very high uh, density. So we did a variety of experiments with different materials, but they all look the same as what I show you here, qualitatively the same. And the behavior of the dependence on the parameters was the same. In that sense, it's boring. <laughs> on the other hand, it's interesting because they all look the same. <laughs> They all look the same and the same type of water, like uh, the same type of lake you water. Or we did. We, you, you, you're stealing my talk. We did experiments in fresh water and salt water, uh, mixtures of fresh water and salt water, and also in deionized water. And I'll show you some of those experiments. Again, it's boring because they all, qualitatively, they all look the same. And I want to get to where they all, what they look like sometime. <laughs> uh, before we get there, though, I mean, this is the capital N is, N sub I, J is the frequency of collisions between flocks of type I and type J. Uh, type I means that, let's say, you have a flock with three particles in it, uh, I would be three. If you had five particles, then J would be five. So this would be the number of collisions per unit volume per unit time between flocks of type with three particles in it and flocks of five particles in it. And small n is the number of particle concentration. So the number of particles per unit dollar. Okay. The thing that relates them is this quantity beta, uh, which tells you how much, how fast particles collide. Uh, the main mechanisms uh, that causes particles to collide are Brownian motion, which is the random motion of particles due to collisions between the particles and uh, the uh, uh, water molecules, uh, and then, and that's only important for very small particles, typically less than one micron. And then fluid shear, uh, which obviously is important if you have uh, any fluid shear present, and it was important in our experiments. Uh, and then the third thing is differential settling, which is uh, similar to fluid shear. But heavier particles settle faster than small particles, and they'll overtake and collide. Now, you can calculate. I mean, that's uh, all these betas are simple mechanical, not simple. They're, they're mechanical calculations that have been made and have been accepted. Uh, and <laughs> these are the expressions for those quantities. And the top one is Brownian motion. K is a Boltzmann constant. T is temperature. U is the viscosity. And then B and I, D, J are the diameters of the colliding particles. Uh, fluid shear uh, is proportional to the fluid shear, G. Uh, and then the diameters there. 
Uh, differential settling obviously has to be uh, dependent on the difference between the settling speeds of the I particle and the J particle. If you assume Stokes' slow is valid and all the plots are the same density, then you can come up with this expression. But in general, that's not true, so you're stuck with this expression. But nevertheless, you can calculate uh, those quantities. In other words, you can calculate how fast particles will hit each other. You cannot calculate if they stick or not, but at least you can calculate uh, whether they uh, hit each other. And this shows that calculation. This shows the beta for Brownian motion, differential settling, and fluid shear for a collision between a particle of one micron and other size particles. Brownian motion is always tends to be small for these particular conditions. Uh, fluid shear, of course, <coughs> depends on the fluid shear. And then, so this curve will move up and down depending on that point. And, and then differential settling is almost always there and important for larger particles. Uh, this is the same type of curve uh, for a 25 micron particle, which is fairly hard, large. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, in those conditions, of course, Brownian motion is always uh, small. Differential settling and fluid shear are the dominant mechanisms. Mm -hmm. OK, I really want to skip these next two slides, despite the fact that uh, people like to talk about them. Uh, the reason I want to skip these two slides is the bottom line after the last two slides it doesn't tell us anything about how particles actually stick. I mean, this is a discussion of, about the potential energy between two colliding particles. But although it, it's interesting, it does not tell us how, whether particles will stick. In other words, particles can come together. Do they stick or don't they stick? Uh, so with that, that was sort of what we knew at the beginning of these experiments. And that was the conventional uh, wisdom, I think. Uh, so we started doing some experiments. And the first type of experiment is with this, what we call a Kuwait flocculator. It's based on the Kuwait viscometer, uh, which was used to measure viscosity of fluids. But it's a very simple device in principle. It's two cylinders. The inner cylinder is stationary. The outer cylinder rotates. And uh, what you do is you take disaggregated sediments, disaggregated particles, put them in the water, put them into the gap between these two cylinders, which is only about two millimeters in diameter. And then you rotate the other outer cylinder at a certain rate. This produces a nice uniform laminar shear throughout the fluid. So the first approximation is absolutely uniform, but you have end effects here. And so you get some secondary flow effects. But in general, you can ignore this. Uh, so you're really producing flocks at a particular uniform shear uh, and at a particular sediment concentration. Okay. And then from time to time, you withdraw fluid uh, and you measure the flock uh, diameter as you go along. Okay. This shows some of our uh, experiments. To start with, do you have a pointer or something? No, that's OK. Uh, it, it was only to think about the first two hours and the first 120 minutes, because that was our standard <coughs> experiment. This is an experiment, uh, a series of experiments at 100 milligrams per liter and different fluid shears. 
So we did an experiment at 400 inverse seconds, 200 inverse seconds, and 100 inverse seconds. They're, the curves are similar in the sense that nothing happens for a while. You suddenly get a fairly rapid flocculation, and then you get to a steady state. And the steady state depends on the fluid shear. The higher the fluid shear, the smaller the flux. Intuitively, that seems fairly obvious. The reason is not so obvious. But nevertheless, that's what happens in all these experiments. Now, in these particular experiments, after two hours, we changed the fluid shear. In other words, 400 went to 100, 200 went to 400, 100 went to 200. The interesting thing, and the reason we did this, is to see what effect the history of the flocculation had on the state of the steady state. And it doesn't have any effect. In other words, whether we went uh, had a constant shear of 100 or 400 and then 100, it didn't really matter. The steady state was the same, whether independently of the history of the flocculation. Okay. That says we have a steady state period. Under, the, under certain conditions, we'll get to a steady state. Okay. So this is the standard curve, sort of an S-shaped curve. And in these conditions, you can see that as the fluid shear increases, the <coughs> median flock diameter decreases. Any questions so far? Or? Yes. Um, so at the point where there's stress change, yes. this on, on these curves, there's a point where there's stress change. Why does one go, why does it go up? Yeah. So that means there's a higher flock diameter? Mm -hmm. Yes. In other words, this is a high fluid shear, 400. And then we reduced it to 100, and the flock size increases. So it just slows so it down with the last for more flux. So the flock size, the steady state flock size, as a, depends on the fluid shear. We also show it depends on the sediment concentration, but at least this, that's what this one shows. Yeah. At these shear rates, you don't see any significant settling out of these particles, you're keeping them suspended, so your, your total concentration is not changing much. Total, remember that it's, it's, it's rotating, so rotating. there's no way for it to settle into no, it, it, it keeps them There are some things between the... Uh, yeah, I thought it was something I did not no, remember the experiment. No, do not do the experiment this way. People <laughs> yeah. have done it that way, and, and we tried it. You're right. <laughs> so, right, 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 right. And that's the end of the experiment. Yeah, yeah, I don't right, know what people are doing with this. Uh, right, that's why. Right. That's not a room where you did the yeah, experiment. You got to do it this way. I'm sorry? You show us the median diameter. Is there a high distribution for each one of these uh, shear rates that we uh, measure uh, size distribution. Just, I don't know how you think of it. I think of it as a fairly narrow size distribution, mm -hmm. uh, sort of Gaussian mm -hmm. type distribution. But that's typical of what we measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we did the other type of experiment we would, where we fixed the fluid <coughs> shear and we changed the sediment concentration. And uh, here you see, as you increase the sediment concentration, the steady state flock diameter decreases. The rate of aggregation is faster as you, as you increase the concentration. So. Uh, for instance, at 800 milligrams per liter, uh, you form a steady state faster, but this diameter is smaller. And now you start, I think you should start to see the similarity of these profiles. In other words, this figure looks exactly like the previous figure in the sense that mm -hmm. the form of the curves is the same, and as I increase the parameter, the 
clock size decreases, steady state clock size decreases. Is there a question? It's because the clocks are hitting each other and preventing larger clocks with more concentration. We'll get to that. That's the rest of my talk. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, that, that, that's that's a very tricky question. Now, so uh, I'll spend some, quite a few. I could spend quite a few hours on it. But I'll just spend a few minutes on it. Okay. Then we did. Uh, you know, this again. This is representative experiments, but this is one with seawater. Uh, Fluid shear, 200 different sediment concentrations. Same type of curve, same S curve. As you increase the sediment concentration, the flock, steady state flock size decreases. Now, if you have a good memory, you'll notice that the steady state flock sizes here are smaller than in the previous slide. Okay. Now, if you don't have a good memory, I'll show you this slide, <laughs> uh, which is one type of sediment, one fluid here, one sediment concentration, but in three different types of water. Seawater, fresh water, and deionized water. Which I think is an interesting curve, because in seawater, the flocks form faster, but in the steady state, they're smaller than in fresh water. Mm -hmm. Deionized water, the flocks form very slowly and eventually they come to a much larger size than either in fresh water or seawater. This is contrary to the conventional wisdom because most people think that flocks are larger in seawater than in fresh water. They're not. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the state that flocks do not form in deionized water. Mm -hmm. And of course they do. Yes. Are these natural seawater and freshwater, or are these uh, solutions that you that are made by mixing salts? Freshwater is. Uh, the water we got out of the tap okay. here. Okay. Sea water uh, is what we got from uh, uh, the uh, yeah. Okay, so right. it's filtered sea water. Okay. Deionized water is what we bought. Right. Yeah. So it could include some organic matter, including yes. microorganisms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but I'd be willing to bet that if you if you kept everything else constant. These these curves we just said. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just trying. In other words, these are the most heavily ionized mm -hmm. yes. water, right. less ionized. Yeah. And then, you know, there might be some ions here too, yeah. because we use deionized water, but we put the real sediments in them. So, right. so wherever you got. Well, there are these individual points replicated. So, we are looking at the, the mean value for each point of several independent experiments? How much? How much, did, how much variation is there? Okay, these is you. You this this is one experiment. Okay. In other words, uh, we ran it in the uh, flocculator with one type of sediment, one type of water, and we use the Malvern particle sizer to measure the particles along the way. Uh, and you get variations uh, <coughs> in, because the flocks, uh, flocks form and they disaggregate. Flocculation is a very dynamic thing. I mean, remember that I showed you that transient flock. Well, that flock forms and breaks apart. Other flocks will form and break apart also. So they're always forming and breaking. Mm -hmm. And this is the variation we get from the particle size. Okay, now I said that in some uh, they the, the curves were similar. In other words, if you look at those S curves, uh, they always, the median size always decreases uh, whether it's fluid shear or the sediment concentration. 
Well, this shows it more clearly. In other words, I, what that says is, what it indicates is, why not plot everything as a function of CT mm -hmm. rather than each variable independently? Mm -hmm. So that's what this is. It's a plot of the median diameter as a function of the fluid concentration times the fluid uh, I mean, particle concentration times the fluid shear. Just one parameter mm -hmm. instead of two independent parameters because they act in essentially the same way. And uh, there again, a uh, nice line uh, straight on the log plot. And seawater, of course, is below that. Uh, again, indicating the flocks are smaller um, in seawater. And this is just a time to steady state. In other words, there's some measure of when the flocks are formed. It's 90% of their uh, steady state. But again, it's uh, a function of CG only. Again, indicating that fluid shear and sediment concentration behave in essentially the same way in causing collisions between the particles. <coughs> Okay, now, sure. these experiments were done in the Kuwait flocculator, and they were experiments where fluid shear was the dominant mechanism. Now, differential settling is inherently present. You can't get rid of that. Uh, but in these experiments, fluid shear was dominant. Now, of course, the question is, well, what happens when you don't have fluid shear? In other words, in the middle of the lake or in the middle of the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, fluid shear, probably not that important. But you do have differential settling. Can you do experiments of that type? Well, the most obvious thing to do is have a settling tube, and you put your disaggregated particles in the settling tube. Uh, and let them settle out and measure things as they flocculate, and settle and flocculate. Well, if you think about it, that, that's an extremely short experiment because things just settle out and you're done with the experiment. So that doesn't work. So the next idea is, well, okay, uh, they'll settle out. Well, no, the next idea was, I was going to make a really long <laughs> solution. And I thought, well, a little longer. I, I really actually was thinking of putting one from the top of engineering down to <laughs> the, the ground. But then you get into problems of heating and cooling and uh, secondary currents. It would have been a nightmare to do something like that. So another idea was to take this settling tube, and as the particles settle out, you turn it upside down. So now the particles settle out the other way, and after a while, you turn it around again, and so on. Uh, if you think about that, you know, you do it this way, and you do it this way, and so on. You realize that what you really want is this device. This is a rotating disk of water. We use two devices. This is the standard one we used in the lab, which is about one foot in diameter. And then this one was another one we used for lower concentration, which is one meter uh, in diameter. But uh, the gap between the two sides of the disk is about one inch, a little larger uh, than an inch. But what, you take the disaggregated sediments, put it in here, put it in this device. You accelerate it to whatever rotational speed you want to relatively slowly. In other words, you don't want a fluid shear at the beginning. But if you accelerate over less than a minute, um, the fluid shear is irrelevant. And after that, what you have is a rotating disk of water. There's no fluid shear, you're just rotating the disk of water. And if you think about a particle, uh, it's rotating this way. Here it's moving faster than the water. But as it gets over here, it's moving slower than the water. And after a while, you realize it's, a sta it's a staying suspended in the water. 
there are collisions between the particles and plots in the water and occasionally collisions between the particles and the wall, but the collisions between the particles and the wall are relatively small compared with the collisions between the particles in the water itself. Okay, so essentially what you've done is able to resuspend particles, let them flocculate, and do this for long periods of time. In other words, we ran this experiment for as long as uh, 30 days mm -hmm. uh, and produced flocks in this way. We used, this is our main device, we used this one to check what was happening at low sediment concentrations. At high sediment concentrations, you can convince yourself collisions between particles are more important than collisions between particles and the wall. Low concentrations is not so obvious, but that's where we compared this one, the results from this device, and the results from this device, and at one, two, five milligrams per liter, we got the same results whether we did it in this one or in that one, saying that the collisions with the wall are really not that important. Those are some of our experimental results. Um, what can I say? <laughs> Curves are starting to get boring in the sense that they're the same type of S curve as the sediment concentration uh, increases, going this way, the steady state plot size de decreases, but the rate of aggregation is larger. And again, this is a, essentially says that uh, the lines are unique. Uh, depending, and the results of the mean and the median diameter depend only on the sediment concentration. The time to steady state again depends only on the concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, with the seawater again below that of the fresh water. Okay. We this is just to demonstrate. The initial experiments were where uh, fluid shear was dominant. And then we did experiments where there's no fluid shear. Uh, so this this was one set of experiments. This was another experiment set of experiments. We decided to do some experiments in between just to show that there was a smooth transition from this set of experiments to that where there was no uh, fluid shear present. In the theoretical analysis, in other words, when we talk about differential settling, we have to know settling speeds. So in all these experiments, at some place along the way, we measure settling speeds. And this is uh, settling speeds of flocks form during settling. Uh, it's, it's a nice straight line. It's not Stokes. Stokes law would say this is d squared, but it's not that at all. And in fact, uh, for very large flocks, it's not even on the straight line. For very large flocks, uh, it's something, I'm not quite sure exactly what the problem is, but the flocks may not have gotten to their steady state yet because it takes a long time for these large flocks to form. Also, the Reynolds number is such that at, for these large flocks, the flow isn't laminar anymore. You tend to get vortices mm -hmm. shed behind them. So this is laminar flow. This is probably not mm -hmm. laminar flow. So those are two reasons why you might not, those points out might not be on that straight line. And the reason why it may not be d squared is because it's kind of a fractal, so it doesn't quite have a full surface. No? Is, that, is that one of the reasons why you get a lower uh, relationship between diameter and settling speed? Because you've got all this kind of fluffy extra uh, 
What I mean by that is you don't have a full area, that's a kind of a... Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the, these large flocks, mm -hmm. these are more or less compacted. Compacted, right. right. Uh, these large flocks, as I said, I don't think they're fully formed yet, mm -hmm. so there's, they're more clumpy, they're more right. open, right. there's flow through uh, the particles, be in between the particles, mm -hmm. so they're not, they're not the same, they don't look the same as right. I mean, I mean. Oh, and uh, again, this is just shows that there is a smooth variation in the settling speed from those for uh, zero uh, fluid shear up to those with uh, fairly high fluid shear. Wanted to cover the whole range rather than leave a gap mm -hmm. between the two. Okay. I'm not going to go into the details of this analysis, but I think it is worthwhile uh, sort of summarizing some of the standard, more or less standard analysis of what was done here. Uh, the standard analysis when we started this experiment, uh, these experiments were primarily the first line here. N sub k is the number of flocks of a certain size with k particles in it. So this is a time rate of change of the number of flocks of type k. And the first line has to do with collisions between, binary collisions between particles. So the number of collisions, if you remember, with beta and i and j. Uh, then we have to throw in this fudge factor because the every collision doesn't uh, end up with a uh, uh, with the particles sticking together. So that's that coefficient. Now, if you take a particle of type K and any other particle, uh, the flock you form is larger. And so that gives you a negative number over here. So this is straight collision <coughs> theory uh, with an unknown factor here where due to the uh, stickiness between the particles. Of course, if you do that, all you get is um, the median size increasing exponentially with time, which is not what our experiments show. So. Uh, people understood this even though they hadn't done the experiments. Uh, and they, so they threw in this term, which is due to fluid shear. So somehow the idea was that as the flocks get larger, fluid shear would break apart these flocks. Uh, this coefficient in the gammas were unknown. You can throw in some numbers and see if it works. If you take these two terms and do a calculation, you will not get the right result. And the reason, if you do these calculations, what you find out is that the median diameter, the steady state median diameter, increases as the sediment concentration increases. That's just opposite to what our experiment shows, just completely opposite. And it's consistent. I mean, every experiment, we've, every series of experiments that we've ever done shows that the median diameter decreases as the sediment concentration increases. So that's, it may be there, but it's not sufficient. So we threw in this term, which has to do with binary collisions. Particles collide, they not only can stick, they can bash together and break the flock apart. You know, the, that <coughs> transient flock uh, I show you, if it, another hard particle comes in there, it goes poof, and that's the end of it. Uh, so this is the 
disaggregation of flocks due to binary collisions. <coughs> if, you, if you include this term, things get better in the sense that as the concentration increases, the median diameter stays the same. That's not quite correct either. So you have to go one step further in, and then you get the idea that there has to be three body collisions. If you put in three body collisions, then indeed you will find out that uh, as you do the calculation that the medium diameter will decrease as the particle concentration increases. You can work backwards, in other words, you can do this calculation and then say, what, do C, what does C have to be in order to get the right result? You'll find that C that has to be dependent upon the sediment concentration, which is the same thing that you would get from three-body collisions. Now, we don't know a lot about three-body collisions because a three-body collision would be two particles coming together, sticking for a while, and then the third particle coming along and hitting it. Well, we don't know. Not to finish. We don't know how long mm -hmm. particles stick together until the third part particle gets it. So we're sort of stuck at that point. Mm -hmm. There is another problem with this type of calculation. If you think about the number of particles in a flock, let's say ten to the six and you were doing this rigorously, K would go from 1 to 10 to the 6. In other words, there would be 10 to the 6 part of, uh, equations of this type. Mm -hmm. Then you would, in each equation you have this summation would be 10 to the 6 particles. Then you have this double summation down here which would be 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6. Uh, if you, would, if you were doing this in a transport calculation, you would have to do this at every grid point in your uh, flow field. And you, even thinking about it, I feel <laughs> overwhelmed, you know. Uh, so there is a, and we did a few calculations just to illustrate that this does work. There. Uh, so we can reproduce the uh, experimental results and that's the particle size distribution. But you can see that as a practical calculation, it's just totally overwhelming. So there's several ways out of it. One is to group states together. In other words, instead of saying each particle, uh, each flock with a certain number of particles is unique, you would group flocks with 10 particles together, 10 to 100 together, and, and so on. And we did a few calculations of this type, but it's fairly crude and wasn't very satisfying. Then you might say, well, do I really want to know all this information? In other words, for a transport calculation, maybe I don't really want to know how many flocks there are of different size. Maybe all I want to know is the median diameter. If I could do that, that would be uh, useful. So you can get, you can start with the previous equations. And the basic assumption that you use is that the particle size distribution is fairly narrow. And essentially, the particles are all of the same in that size distribution are pretty much the same. You use summation and integration, and then you come up with this equation, where this d is the median size of the flock. Now, this is a trivial calculation. I mean, it's just ordinary differential equation for the median size. Uh, it's I don't know. It, uh, all I can say is a trivial calculation. But as you do it, you might notice that the parameters that, are, that appear when, when the fluid shear is dominant is CG. Mm -hmm. You don't get G independently, as in the experiments, it's always CG. Mm -hmm. 
into these, this equation reproduces all the experimental results uh, that I showed you uh, within, I think, something like 25%. So for, for practical calculations, uh, this is as accurate as you need to be for to reproduce the experimental results and also to use in a transport uh, calculation. If you really want to do something trivial, you would say, well, in the quasi-steady state, time rate of change is equal to zero, and in that case, this bracket here has to be zero, and you get that. And then if you work backwards, then you can get the results for the steady state uh, uh, flop size from this equation. Mm -hmm. And it agrees exactly with those uh, equations and graphs that I showed you previously. The exponents aren't quite the same because they were derived independently of each other. One was derived directly from the experiments, best fit to the experimental data. And this has some sort of a theoretical basis to it, which is a little bit different. But the exponents are almost the same. OK. What, as far, I think we were, by this series of experiments, I think we've been able to describe certain basic parameters such as fluid shear, sediment concentration, and salinity, and their effects on the aggregation and disaggregation of particles. For each different type of particles, the curves uh, will be different in magnitude. But they all have similar size. Uh, the basic theory will be similar in nature. If we extend this to nano-sized particles, and Bob and his associates were forgotten at this point, but uh, they did some preliminary experiments. And I don't think there were any surprises. In other words, at, for very small nano-sized particles, Brownian motion is dominant. Mm -hmm. and there is a slow aggregation uh, due to Brownian motion now, which was not important in these uh, uh, experiments. But after a while, nano-sized particles become micro-sized flocks. Once they become micro-sized, then everything that I showed you is uh, stays essentially the same, and you get this rapid flocculation to a uh, steady state, and it stays steady after that. So, what I would <laughs> like to see, and I was hoping there'd be some interest here, would be the extension mm -hmm. of these experiments to nano-sized particles, different types of nano-sized particles, and maybe more emphasis on salinity or pH, which we did not cover very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thank you. And maybe somehow that's those of the toxicity studies that we, that we have, how that might vary the the well, we, we've done uh, first of all, we did uh, a lot of experiments on the absorption of organic chemicals with large partition coefficients to uh, these fine grain sediments. And it's quite clear that the size of the flocks uh, is important as far as absorption rate is concerned. Because in one case, you have absorption to individual particles, which is fairly rapid because they're small particles. In the other case, 
you have absorption of large flocks, and they not only have to absorb into the particles, but they have to get into the middle of this large flock, which is a much slower process. So the large flocks, um, the rate absorption is, is much less than the small flocks. Uh, we also did uh, absorption to bacteria, uh, and in that case, <laughs> that was interesting because uh, as, again, the, the bacteria tended to aggregate and form, well, flocks or aggregates of bacteria, and at the beginning, the absorption into bacteria was fairly rapid because of their small size, but later on, it was much slower because they have to, again, absorb into the bacteria but also get into the middle of these large aggregates. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that that type of experiment would, would, would be essential to nanosized particles also, looking at the absorption. You know, one thing we found with some of the metal nanomaterials is that the toxicity biological effect comes from the dissolution of the, the metal ion into the water column. So flocculation probably has an important effect on the, the rate at which those things might mm -hmm. dissolve, yeah. therefore influencing the, the toxicity. Mm -hmm. Potentially the ones and materials that are on the flocks themselves. Mm -hmm. That's possible, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The more it's broken up, the faster you get the solution. Well, uh, we talk a lot about particles as if they were uniform in some sense, but everything I've ever thought about particles means that they're coated mm -hmm. in some way with organic or inorganic metals or hydroxides or something like this. In other words, they're not. There's nothing like a silicon dioxide particle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we do have some in the lab, but, <laughs> but not in the <laughs> okay. So that would influence the dissolution. Um, yes. Did you attempt to uh, quantify the amount of exopolymers that are in the seawater? And, and with that being said, why, why did you choose to use uh, the tap water as fresh water instead of like lake water or something because that would have also have exopolymers? So we, just we did not measure exopolymers. Uh, we chose tap water because that's what's <laughs> what's there. <laughs> uh, our main interest at time at that time uh, was fresh waters, uh, mainly Great Lakes. Waters. Uh, tap water in in this area is also highly variable because it can either come from Lake Katrina or it can come from the ground uh, water here, and they're quite different. Uh, it didn't seem well. We did we did notice a difference. Uh, we did not investigate that very carefully because. Our main emphasis at the beginning certainly was the effects of fluid shear and sediment concentration. So what we tried to do was, was do experiments with a particular type of sediment, a particular type of water, and keep conditions constant there while we varied fluid shear and sediment concentration. It was only later that we started to vary salinity also. But no, we did not look carefully at these other variables, which may may be important. Well, they're playing seawater because there was because the rate of formation was faster in seawater. I could potentially because exopolymers and um, materials and clays and metals can aggregate so it's right? And it's confirmed. And I don't have any data on that. Just imagining these, these particles coming together, I would think the size of the particle would have a huge effect on on the, the flock, just because if you have smaller particles, you have essentially a more dense 
aggregate, we have less interstitial space between particles. Do you, uh, have you thought about or, or you know, looked at any flocks of, of smaller particles versus larger, and if those are those smaller ones are stronger or you know harder to break up, and how that might affect them? Uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Um, in uh, during all our experiments, uh, we not only produced flocks and measured their sizes. We took photographs of many of them. These these are only a few. But the other thing we did is measure the settling speeds. Now, as soon as you, the reason we measured settling speeds is that. Indirectly, you can get the effective density of these flocks from the settling speeds. Knowing the size and the settling speeds, you can get an effective density out of that. So, uh, from that, yes, we did get the densities of these flocks varied enormously by several orders of magnitude. And you're right, I mean, one large flock has a density of 2.6 mm -hmm. per cubic centimeter, roughly, or 1.6 relative to that of water, while these uh, large flocks made up of very small particles can have a density relative to that of water of about 1.01 1 .01 or something mm -hmm. like that. In other words, several orders of magnitude mm -hmm. less than a solid particle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the reversibility when you change the shear rate yeah. in the QS cluster experiment. So I was wondering whether that's also true for the DI1 experiment. Because I think there is something on the energy barrier. The DI1 is there should be a higher energy barrier. So that means if you form some flux, maybe it's not reversible. I was wondering if you can get uh, yeah, now we got to get back to the slide I think I tried to ignore. <laughs> I just it should I, or you can just start and put it back. Yeah, they're on the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it was there. Okay. Uh, this is a general schematic of potential energy between two interacting particles. And you have repulsive forces and attractive forces. Repulsive forces are generally electrostatic uh, forces. Uh, attractive forces in our van der Waals. And then as you get real close, you have uh, very strong repulsive forces. Uh, the net interaction between these two is something that looks like this, and then there's a deep well, and it comes up. Now, if you think of a particle, it comes in here with some kinetic energy it has a low kinetic energy, it probably just comes in here and goes right back out again. If it has a high kinetic energy, it can get over this hump and it'll drop down here. But as it drops, it gets more and more kinetic energy. Because so it comes shooting back up here, drops back here, and out, out it goes. So for particles with the, uh, which are elastic, it just comes in here and goes out again. This diagram doesn't tell me anything about whether these particles will stick or not. Because yeah. I don't know if, they, if it's elastic, fine. If it's inelastic, well, that's different. But I don't know whether the particles will stick. And that diagram doesn't tell me anything. Now, that figure does depend upon the solidity or ionic strength of the fluid. If I have low ionic strength, then the potential energies look like this, and there's a well 
If I have high IMR strength, like uh, saline waters, then I have a curve that looks like this. So if high ionic strength particle comes in here, goes down in the potential well, again, if it's elastic, it will just come up, bounce, and come back out again. If it has low ionic strength, it may not collide, but generally they, there are some fractions that have enough kinetic energy that will get up here and come into this potential well. If it's elastic, it will come in and bounce out again. So this is high ionic, ionic strength, this is low ionic strength. It tells you something about how particles, how fast particles will collide. It tells you nothing at all about whether the particles will stick or not. Yeah. To what extent do your results depend on having some distribution of size of the particles? Would you get pretty much the same results if you started with a set of truly identical particles? Okay. Or does the variability in size of the grains make a, a, play, a, play a fundamental role in determining the results you get? Well, certainly differential settling depends on the variation uh, in particle size. Uh, fluid shear, I mean, the rate depends on uh, differentiation in size, but you would, even if they were uniform in size, you would still get aggregation due to fluid shear. So if you had absolutely uniform sized particles with no fluid shear, well, you would have Brownian motion, which would eventually uh, make these things aggregate. Thank you very much.